Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ Envy, Angela Yee, Charlemagne the Guy. We are The Breakfast Club. We have a special guest in the building. Yes, indeed. Nicole Hannah-Jones. Welcome. Thank you. Now, yeah. she's a staff writer for the New York Times Magazine and author of The 1619 Project. Man, if you have not read The 1619 Project, you need to. Uh, it's infuriating, all right? But most stories about slavery are for, for black people. But what made you want to re- release this project now? It was a couple of things. So I've been obsessed with 1619 for a long time. I first came across that date in high school, and I had never been taught that people of African descent had been here that long, which felt very intentional. So as the anniversary, the 400th anniversary was approaching, I just knew most American households were going to, it was going to pass and people wouldn't even know it was an anniversary. Mm-hmm. We're not mm-hmm. going to take this moment to commemorate what that meant. And it just seemed like a great opportunity to kind of uh, force this country to, to reckon with the legacy of slavery. And, of course, what I'm arguing is 1619 is as foundational to the American story as the year 1776. Yeah, well, you said, uh, I think you said in the article that um, th- there was no American democracy until black people. Right. Yeah, for sure. So if you think about that, when Thomas Jefferson is writing the Declaration of Independence, saying that all men are created equal, um, uh, given inalienable rights by our creator, he owns 130 human beings and actually (laughs) has his enslaved brother-in-law there with him to keep him comfortable as he's writing those words. And a majority of the founders were enslavers. They owned other humans. The Constitution codifies slavery and denies the vote to most Americans. So women can't vote under that original Constitution, Native people and Black people. That's not democracy. But Black folks actually took those words literally. Mm -hmm. And uh, really through 250 years of struggle and resistance, started to make our founding documents real. Yeah, it was something, you said something in one of these, I don't remember, I think it was in chapter one where you talked about how uh, slaves always rebelled. Yes. Like, you know, and I think that's what, a misconception, especially when Kanye said slavery was a choice. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, we're definitely not going to talk about what Kanye said about slavery because <laughs> that's ridiculous. Um, we, people of African descent, rebelled before we even got to the slave ship. Mm-hmm. We were rebelling when they were trying to force us onto the ships. We rebelled on the ships. And we certainly rebelled. I mean, one of the very first slave rebellions occurs in the 1600s. Uh, constantly people were fighting. Of course they were. Like, it's illogical to think that people ever accepted slavery. But we also had to think about what the odds were, right? We had no weapons, no army. um, And many, you know, we were outnumbered in the United States. Yet even so, we were constantly fighting a rebellion and both using the law and using the same means as the revolutionaries um, in, in that we would at times take a violence to try to gain our freedom. What makes you so passionate about this project? Uh, Because... I write about race and inequality for a living. And we all hear people look at the circumstances that black Americans live in today. And they say that this is just because somehow we're pathological. Somehow we don't want better. Uh, But we live in uh, circumstances that were intentionally created. And the anti-black racism that begins to justify slavery is the same anti-black racism that keeps black people in the conditions we are now. Uh, I think that we would prefer to deny the truth of our history. We want to believe that we are an exceptional country when really we were just one of many nations that practiced slavery, um, that deprived individuals of their rights. And so if we're ever going to truly address the conditions that people live in now, we have to deal with how we got here. And you can see that with the conservative activists that rushed to condemn your project. Uh, I think I think uh, Eric Erickson, he described the project as opinion writers who profit from seeing things through racial lenses and keeping racial tension aflame as much as Trump does. <laughs> well, one, you, you have to laugh at anyone who's mad that you see slavery through a racial lens. Word. Since <laughs> slavery was Word. clearly uh, created through a racial lens. But most of the conservatives who have uh, come out against the project, it's clear they haven't read a single word of it. They're not calling out the facts of it. They can't argue the facts. They just don't like what it's saying. And that's because we're not used to centering black folks. We're used to black people being either invisible or treated as the bottom. And what this project is saying is we're actually the real Americans. Mm -hmm. We believed in uh, equality and and the ideals of the founding documents, even when the founders did it. And that makes people very upset, like I expected. So what are your thoughts on reparations as we've been talking? about it what do you think about reparations and what do you think we should get if you believe in it (laughs) so you know I'm I'm a journalist not an activist but what I will say is I don't know how you come uh, you read this project and not come away with the realization that something is clearly owed I can feel it from there you can't strip away you know centuries of the ability to create wealth 
um, not just from slavery, but 100 years of legal apartheid and even what's happening now and not believe that something is owed to those descendants to try to make it right. So um, one of the pieces that will be coming later in the project will really be at a piece that's assessing what is owed and how do we get to it. Well, um, what you're saying is true, but that's all ties into the fact that that's why, probably why they always try to dismiss it and overlook it and discredit it. Because as long as they can do that, then they never have to deal with the realization, yeah, we do owe these, owe these people. 100%. What, what's amazing, uh, this is why I love history, I study history so much, is uh, white Americans were arguing against reparations, like r- literally in the months after slavery ended. Um, when you had actual victims of people who had like two months earlier been enslaved, white Americans were saying, well, we shouldn't give them anything special. It's going to make them lazy. So this argument that uh, black people owe nothing uh, for enslavement really began right at the end of enslavement when you had living victims of the institution. We've never wanted to make this right. Uh, Really, uh, if you read my opening piece, Abraham Lincoln, once he decided he needed to end slavery, wanted to send black people somewhere else, um, did not want us to be here. So we were never supposed to actually exist in America outside of being used for bondage. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've actually, as a people, been being punished ever since. And he gave the slave masters reparations. Yes, yes. The only people in America <laughs> who have ever received reparations for slavery have been the white people who enslaved us. That's crazy. You, you, you started off by talking about the fact that they don't educate us on slavery. Why do you, why do you think that is? I think there's two reasons. So slavery, uh, the very fact that there are 40 million black people in this country right now gives lie to our founding uh, myth. Right. Our founding myth is that we are a country born out of freedom, out of the z- desire to be free. But you can't really make that argument when the very people who founded this country were enslaving one fifth of the population. Mm-hmm. One out of every 20 Americans at the revolution were enslaved. So because of that, um, we don't want to teach about this thing that gives lie to who we are. How do you teach about the greatness of George Washington and they say he owned 200 people and forced them to work on a slave labor camp. Absolutely. How do you teach about Thomas Jefferson and say, you know, look at Monticello, but uh, enslaved people who were getting their backs laid open with whips are the ones who built Monticello. Mm. Uh, They're the ones who produce the wealth that allows Thomas Jefferson at the age of 33 to be able to write the Declaration, right? So all of these things are very uncomfortable because they give lie to who we want to believe we are as Americans. However, I argue that um, the founders... Even though they didn't believe in the ideals, they set out the ideals and the template that allow black people to fight and resist and bring us closer to our democracy. So we shouldn't actually be ashamed of that. Um, We should actually feel very good about that. But it's just um, we don't want to deal with our our founding hypocrisy and our paradox. We want to believe that we were the greatest, most freest country in the world. And it's just not true. You know, even when you talk about uh, this being the 400th anniversary of slavery, I always wonder, how should I respond to that? Is that something to be celebrated? No, certainly not celebrated, but it's something we should commemorate and mark. We Mm -hmm. shouldn't just um, allow this history to be buried and to act like it doesn't matter because uh, the conceit of the magazine, it's not a history. It's really saying you can look across all these aspects of modern day society and see the legacy of slavery. And I'll just give a quick example. We're the only Western industrialized country that doesn't have universal health care. The only one. That goes back to slavery and the, the desire to deny black people access to common goods. So when you look at polling on this, if white Americans believe that black people will benefit from a social program, they oppose that program. So mm. this racialized opposition means not only are black people being hurt, but millions of white Americans don't have health insurance, can't get access to good health care, are dying because of white racism against black folks. So you can't even contain the harm. And in the magazine, we give Tons of examples, right? Sugar, why there's so much traffic in Atlanta, uh, geography, capitalism, the dysfunction in our politics. All of this kind of goes back to that original sin. And that's really what uh, this project is trying to do is not just force us to reckon with the past, but force us to reckon with the ways that all Americans are still suffering from that legacy. Did you say traffic in Atlanta? Yes. Explain that. So there's a piece in there that talks about how uh, when they're designing the interstate highway system in Atlanta, uh, they're really, including Mayor Hartsfield, whom the Atlanta airport is named after, wants to create uh, traffic patterns that will split black communities off from white communities. They want to create highway systems that will segregate black folks. And so the Atlanta highway system, if you think about it, it's nonsensical. It's not built in a way that actually gets people from place to place as fast as it can. But it is uh, it's logical if you understand that they built it to actually separate black communities by these uh, large interstate highways from white people. So when white folks are, you know, sitting in traffic for four hours in Atlanta, they can thank racism for that, too.
Wow. Really? <laughs> really? <laughs> I wonder how much of it is business related, though. Like, how much of it is actually they hate black people or how much of it is business? Because you even think about, you know, the Civil War was really about the business of slavery, right? Yeah, it's kind of chicken and the egg. So clearly, we uh, we buy that first group of we. Uh, white colonists buy that first group of Africans for business purposes, right? You can work people as long as you want. They have no rights. You can work them from sunup to sundown. Um, that is a business decision. But then you have to justify how you are enslaving people. And then that becomes a racial decision. So I think originally, yes. And so much of capitalism, racialized capitalism, capitalism that is built on exploiting black people is not necessarily that the people who are doing it hate black people, but they know they've created a vulnerable population that they can exploit mm. and that our institutions are not going to stand up for. So I, I think it's both. But I also do think there's just a lot of anti-black racism in this country that we're born into it. Um, if you ask any person, black or white, to name 10 stereotypes about black people, they could tick them off just like that. That's because um, we just are, are awash in this anti-blackness that really has to develop to justify our founding lie. The only way that we can justify how we're both a nation um, founded on individual liberty and a nation founded on slavery is to say that black people are somehow less human, less deserving of democracy, less deserving of the protection of our institutions. And so therefore we say we're not hypocritical because if they're not people like us, then it's okay to exploit them. Mm. I want to know what got you into journalism? What got you so passionate? What did you read? <laughs> what did you see? What did you say as a child that says, this is what I want to do? So one, I was like a nerdy ass kid. Uh, okay. I read newspapers from a really young age. I always loved history. I used to watch the History Channel with my dad. And um, I was bused from black schools to white schools starting in second grade, Iowa. Iowa, okay. Uh, there's black folks everywhere, just in case anyone's wondering. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so why did you go to white schools? Why not so, black schools? Uh, our, so our school's uh, school district... No matter, you know, if there's a handful of black folks, they will find a way to segregate us. So the schools were segregated in my hometown and uh, my parents entered me into a busing program to get me out of segregated schools into higher performing schools. It was part of a voluntary desegregation program. And I just remember, so I would ride the bus um, one hour each way to and from school and just see how the landscape changed as we got closer Absolutely. to the white side of town. All of a sudden, the roads got paved. There were parks. There were stores. Uh, it was there grass. Were, it was grass. There were nicer houses. Right. But then I also would see how hard everybody in my family and the black folks on my side of town worked. And I knew that they wanted the same things. So what media was giving us about why black uh, sides of town look so bad just didn't make sense to me. So I just started reading so I could try to understand. Um, and once I got in high school, I had I was bused to a white high school. I had this one semester uh, black studies class that really radicalized me because it was the first time anyone had ever signed me all these books about black folks. And I was like, shit, there's so much history. Nobody taught us that at on a white purpose school. at a white school. It Crazy. was one semester. But um, so I complained to that teacher one day that our high school newspaper never wrote about kids like us. And he said, if you don't like it, join the newspaper or shut up and don't come complain to me. So I joined the newspaper. I had a column call from the African perspective. My first investigation was whether Jesus was white or not. Um, what did you come up with? <laughs> He's black. I came up with, I couldn't prove that he was black, but I definitely could prove he wasn't white, which was kind of really the point anyway. Um, and after that, I really got hooked on the power of us telling our own stories, of uh, not allowing um, people outside of our community to be the only ones shaping the narrative. Mm -hmm. And that's really what I've spent my whole career trying to do, is show that um, racism is not just about individual people who don't like black people. It's about these systems and structures that really work to keep black folks uh, on the bottom of the caste system. And it takes being involved. Like you said, you, you had to get involved in your school newspaper to tell these stories. Like Absolutely. You, you have to be at the New York Times to make sure these stories are told. I don't understand why we get so upset when our people want to seat at the table or get a seat at the table. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think you can't argue. The New York Times is the largest news organization uh, in the world, right? We The platform of the New York Times is, is really unparalleled. And so if we're not there, then who's shaping the worldwide narrative about black Absolutely. folks? Now, it clearly matters what you do when you get that seat at the table. Like if you go into these institutions and you're not pressing back and you're not uh, pushing back against the narrative and creating a counter narrative, then it doesn't do any good for us to be there. But we clearly have to be there uh, if we want to shape the way that we're seen in the world. Yeah, you don't want to be Ben Carson. You do not. <laughs> at least not the, the current iteration. Yes. Because I, I, I learned stuff reading this article. Like I did not know that slavery ended because of the 13th Amendment. I always thought it was the Emancipation Proclamation as well. Yeah. So uh, 
what people don't get is Abraham Lincoln was actually not that concerned. He was opposed to slavery, but he was also like, if we can keep slavery and keep the union together, we'll keep slavery. Absolutely. And the Emancipation Proclamation was a war tactic. It was trying to punish the Confederate states and say, if you don't come back to the union, we will free your labor source and then you'll be bankrupt and have to. So, yeah, the, the emancipation only freed those who were enslaved in the Confederacy, which Lincoln actually didn't have control over those because it was in the Confederacy. And it would take the end of the Civil War uh, to actually get the end of legal slavery in the United States. Well, what, what except, you, of course, if you're incarcerated. Which is what's going on right now. Yes. And what exactly was the 13th Amendment? It was that. Yeah. So the 13th yes. Amendment ends slavery. And it's funny because our Constitution protects slavery, but never mentions the word slavery, mm-hmm. which is very intentional. The founders understand uh, the, the hypocrisy of what they're doing. So they both protect slavery, but don't mention the word. And the first time the word slavery is ever mentioned in the Constitution is when they end it. And that's what the, the 13th Amendment says, that you cannot have slavery uh, except unless someone commits a crime and is incarcerated. And so, of course, a lot of people understand what that is meant, which is that um, we have implemented a new quasi-slavery through our penal system. Yes. Now, you mentioned a seat at the table. What did you think about uh, Jay-Z's deal with the NFL? <laughs> why are you laughing Or is that, that another article? <laughs> why, oh, yeah, why are you laughing like that? That was a, the evil grin, the evil laugh. <laughs> um, Be honest. I don't understand it. Okay. Um, But I'm also like, uh, I guess we have to wait and see what actually comes out of it. But it's not something, I mean, I've talked to a lot of my folks about it because um, you're trying to see the end game. But right now, I think it's hard to understand why you would, what is the benefit to the larger cause of justice? Mm-hmm. And I can see what the personal benefit to him is, but I don't know what the, What's the, the larger benefit, benefit is. You, you think? I mean... I think being able to control who goes to the Super Bowl is is like a huge platform for uh, title and for him. And I also think uh, clearly there's a financial benefit to it. But it doesn't seem like he really needs to do things just for financial benefit. So that's where I think you have to wait and see, you know, what's the the larger plan. But um, a lot of folks found it very hard to kind of see him sitting up there with Goodell, knowing like what's happened and like what. What what's the larger benefit for justice? I don't know. I think the larger cause for justice is the fact that the NFL has that uh, program called Impact Change, and they have pledged to donate hundreds of millions of dollars to different organizations in the black community, people that are actually doing the work. And I think Jay is just keeping a checks and balances of the of, of where that money is going. Basically, so you're comfortable with it? Yes, I am. Only reason I am because I just think it's logically inconsistent to want Kaepernick to be back in the league. And want can, can champion Eric Reed being in the league, but be mad at Jay for working with the league to right. help make it a better space for black and brown people. Like it's just kind of logically inconsistent to be to champion one but be against the other. Like I don't understand it. And it goes back to what we said about being at the seat at the table. Like if it, and like you said, it's, he's somebody I trust at the table. You yeah, know? and that's really uh, what so many people I've talked to have concluded is like we know kind of what his track record is, so you have to kind of give the benefit of the doubt. Um, but then I'm like, what? how are we addressing the larger issue, which is that when players speak out for black justice, that they are punished for that. So giving money to other institutions is great. But does that deal fundamentally with when these players are using their platforms to speak out against things like black people being killed by the police? Yeah. Is it something that they will continue mm-hmm. to face ramifications and punishment for outside of one person? Uh, Colin Kaepernick is one person. He made a settlement, but it clearly sent a message to every other player that if you speak up, this is what's going to happen to you. And I, I I, just wonder what will be the larger dealing with that, which is really the more fundamental issue. No, I agree. I mean, I, but, I, but Eric Reed is still doing it. Kenny Stills is still doing it. And Eric Reed's getting drug tested like every two months, right? He is getting months, drug tested right? every two months. And, then, and from what I was told, there's going to be a platform created for players to have a voice. I don't know if it's going to be like a podcast network or something, but they're not trying to stifle the players' voices from what I'm hearing. I mean, I'm a journalist, so I I never think it's wise to just jump to conclusions. I think you really do have to uh, sit there and and see how it plays out. But then it's like, how long do you give whatever plan is being yeah. implemented to be implemented before you can assess what, what's happening. According to Twitter, a week. <laughs> All right? <laughs> Twitter is a week-long process. Yeah, as you know, you cannot live your life by Twitter. Ugh, not at all. Twitter will turn God. on you from yeah one day to the next just like that. So. How does that make it hard for you as a journalist, social media? Like, like just Twitter? Like, Yeah, I mean, it can be, as you know, both good and bad. Mm-hmm. So 
Twitter can be incredibly democratizing. What I love about Twitter is before, if a place like the New York Times wrote something that people felt was derogatory or unfair to our community, all you could do was send a letter to the editor and they may or may not publish it. But now, like, People can instantly say this was racist or this was wrong. And they're changing in real time Mm -hmm. the way that we're reporting, the headlines we're writing. And I love that because I think it gives marginalized people power that they didn't have before. Uh, But then there's also like the Twitter mob, right? That's not thinking things through. That's not being realistic. That is attacking anyone who doesn't say exactly what they want to say. And that can be very toxic. So I just drink a lot of bourbon and take uh, Twitter breaks. (laughs) My only problem is I don't have any problem with your opinion as long as it's an informed opinion. Did you really yes. read the sixteen nineteen problem? Nine, nine, nine oh, times out of ten, no. That's what I'm saying. Or did you just look at people's reaction to it and then you came to your own conclusion? Because if you read it, there's no way you could possibly have anything bad to say about it. Thank you for saying that. I mean, one, we were extremely careful. Um, I understood how fraught this project was, so we were careful with everything, including language. Like, I, I create a style book. Like, we're not going to call people slaves. We're not gonna uh, use blacks as a uh, noun, right? We're mm. gonna we're gonna we're gonna have a very consistent style. So n- almost every time when someone has something bad to say about it, they'll say, "Well, you didn't talk about this," and I'm like, "Well, it's actually in there on page 35, but you didn't read it." Um, that is the problem with Twitter. P- people read either a headline, mm. but that's the problem with how people consume media in general, yeah. right? They either read a headline or like what someone says about it and aren't actually going and attempting to read it themselves with uh, forming an opinion. And I'm the kind of person like, I like to argue anyway. So I'm on there like going back and forth with people. Then I get texts from my friends like, why are you arguing with this dude who has 20 followers? Like what? Like what are you doing? So I, I myself had to learn to like pull back and not defend and like not argue with every person. Well, well, how can, can people read uh-huh. it though? So if people who don't know, how can they read what you wrote, the 1619 Project? Sure. So there's uh, it's online. Mm-hmm. If you just go to the New York Times website, it's all online. Uh, we also have... Uh, created, we've partnered with the Pulitzer Center and created an entire K through 12 curriculum that is for free. Um, I'm already getting tweets from teachers who are teaching this project, so, which does my heart good because maybe if we teach kids right the first time, we don't have to reteach them 20 years from now. Um, and we're also giving out free copies all across the city. So um, you can go to the Schomburg Center in Harlem uh, and get free copies. We were at Afropunk all weekend giving out copies, and uh, eventually we're you know I. This is recorded, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, if we can work it out with y'all, we want to announce that we that we're gonna like pull up a truck to the New York Times, and people can just come to the Times Let's and, do and get it. copies. Yeah. You can pull up to the station right here. Okay. Mm-hmm. We just have to work out the day of like Let us when know. this is coming out. I want to know though what, what's wrong with calling people slaves? Only because like back then in historical context, they looked at us as three fifths of a person. So. I think that slaves is very dehumanizing. Slave says that this is you as a person, that you were a slave. I think slave, uh, being enslaved was a condition. It was a condition that white people enforced upon us, but it wasn't who we are as our identity. And so using the term slave was a way to to denote that we were not equal to them. We couldn't be citizens. We were not, we were not fully human. And I don't choose to replicate that when speaking about our ancestors. I, I like to talk about slavery as a condition, but not as uh, who that who these people were. But weren't they trying to dehumanize us? Though? Of course. But we yeah. shouldn't repeat that language. Right. So they created this language to dehumanize us. And every time we repeat that, then we're actually kind of following their same logic. So that's why, like, I don't use slave owner. I, I call them enslavers. Like, make it uh, make it more real what they're doing. I don't use the word plantation. I call it forced labor camps because that was what it was. So this language is all the ways that we justify what was really uh, the most atrocious, besides the uh, genocide of Native Americans, the most atrocious things that this country ever did. And we should use the language that shows that. I call them racist, bigot, crack-ass, cracker, white devils. Yeah, Maybe. I don't think that's going to get in the New York Times, but... <laughs> <laughs> why, do you think, why do you think America has yet to apologize for slavery? Though? Oh, God. Um, I think that white Americans believe if an apology comes, then the next thing you have to do is try to remedy the wrong. Yeah. Right. Which is obvious. You can't say I'm sorry for this wrong and then not try to fix it. So by not apologizing, by saying we don't have to apologize to you for anything, um, then you don't then have to take the next steps and to uh, do the remedy. I mean, I hear every single day a white person saying uh, all these white people died to free you. So why are you complaining? And I'm like, well, one, you don't get credit for fighting to end the institution you created. Like that was your obligation. Uh, But two. 
tons of black folks also fought beginning in the Revolutionary War and were fighting actually for your freedom because we didn't get it. And we also fought in the Civil War. So it's it's this continuous downplaying of what the harm was and an inability to uh, admit it because then you can't admit it and then not do anything about it. What was the most surprising thing you learned about doing this? Because you are a historian already. So what did you learn? He's like, wow. The most surprising thing actually that I learned um, was that I was actually patriotic. I didn't actually mm. uh, realize till I was writing this piece. I mean, like many black folks, I've always felt in opposition to my own country. Uh, I've never wanted to claim the flag. I write in my essay how the fact that my dad, who was a veteran, flew the flag was very embarrassing to me when I was younger. Um, and in writing this essay and really thinking about the role that black people play, like we're we're kind of taught to be ashamed of our history, ashamed that we were enslaved, ashamed that we don't know anything uh, other than our history starting here. And um, through this essay, I really came to understand like we we need to claim that history. We need to claim our country. No one fought harder to make this country what it is than we have, not just for black Americans, but every other right struggle comes really out of black resistance. And um, no one should tell us that we're not fully American and we should not allow people to make us feel less than fully American. And that's probably the most surprising thing that came out of me working on this project. Were you shocked when Oprah tweeted about it? Yeah. I mean, I've been shocked at uh, the reaction to this in general. I mean, it is, you know, it's it's very hard. It's about slavery. People don't tend to want to talk mm -hmm. about it. Um, but we like sold out of copies all across the country. Mm -hmm. We've done that's two dope. print runs um, and sold out of both of those print runs. And my inbox is full of people trying to get their hands on it. We had lines at Afropunk of people, you know, who are there to have a good time. That's amazing. But who are like, give us, we want these copies. Um, so, yeah, that's been kind of the most amazing and surprising thing. And this is, uh, you know, it, it's obviously the blackest thing the Times has ever done. Like, you can look at the yeah. contributors page, mm -hmm. nearly every writer, the photographers, the artists, they're all black. Um and I just love the idea that the descendants of those who were enslaved uh, were able 400 years later in the paper of record to produce this documentation of, of, of this history. Well, I, no. would, I would love to give these away at, at our juice bar. Angelie and I own a juice bar in Brooklyn. We would love to give it away. And you know what would be dope, too? Going to some of these homecomings, especially Hampton University Absolutely. because of Hampton, of course. Virginia, yeah. Virginia, of course, and Howard and some of these colleges. South Carolina State. That would be like... Really, really, because people need to know about this story if they don't know. I want to get that, Frank. You know, we have the International African American Museum opening in Charleston, South Carolina. It's going to mm. be on Gatchin's Wharf. And you spoke about it in the article about how, you know, the slaves that came from West Africa right into that That's port. Right. If I'm not mistaken, I think it's like 50, 60 percent of all yeah. slaves. Um, yes, mm -hmm. yeah. it is. Absolutely. So I would love to get that framed and put in that museum. Yeah, we would love to do that. And we've given, um, we've sent copies so far to about 10 to 12 HBCUs. We've been trying to work with Hampton to ship copies there. Um, Their mailing so, system's kind of messed up, I heard. No, it's like not. Like a bootleg. <laughs> you gotta, like, you you gotta I'm not saying now. nothing you about that. You now, man. Um, we'll get it there. Yeah, but I know like we're at Morehouse, we're at mm -hmm. Howard, we've sent to several, and um, we... I mean, I personally fundraise to print mm -hmm. uh, more than 200,000 additional copies that we could just give out to make mm -hmm. sure it wasn't just time subscribers who got access mm -hmm. to this. So, yeah, any I, I would love to send copies to uh, you to give out at your juice bar. I'll give you my number. Yeah, we'll, we'll get it to and President Harvey over there and we'll make sure that the students get this. That Yeah, that would be awesome. And we're going to also uh, be doing events all across the country, also at HBCUs mm -hmm. as well, uh, just to, I mean, I feel like, this project is not just trying to reframe the way white people think about this history, but really I wrote this for us. Right. I wanted us to stop being ashamed, to have the, the, the language, to have the history, to be able to push back against the narrative about who we are. Um, and so of anyone that I want to read it, I want it to be us. Gotcha. And uh, particularly students who... Hopefully, again, um, if we can teach them right in the first place, they don't have to be 40-something years old before they learn that they can be proud of of our past. So. And they might be 40-something years old thinking slavery is a, was a choice. So exactly. You, right, stop, exactly. You got to school them. <laughs> well, Nicole, we appreciate you joining us. Thank, Thank you. you so much. And we'll get this to Hampton, and we'll get this no, to as many it. people as we possibly can. Tell them again how they can read it online. If you go to uh, the New York Times and just look for 1619 Project, it's online. You can also go to the Pulitzer Center. And um, if you Google 1619, you can download the entire project for free at the Pulitzer Center. You got to read it. Must That's read. Right. All right. Well, it's Nicole Hannah-Jones and it's the Breakfast Club. Good morning. Thank you.